Okay. Um, the title of this message is Two Peacemakers. Two Peacemakers. Or we could have titled it The Removal of Two Peacemakers. The Removal of Two Peacemakers. Um, two men, both were rich. They had the life of luxury. They decided to, in a, in a, in a lifestyle sense, Changed their lives to serve the country, and um, naturally, no men are perfect, and, and analogies only hold up so far. So that everything isn't perfect in this one. But I want to mention it because I see a pattern, and and uh, we we mentioned this at the uh, prophecy forum uh, at the feast. And I want to just go through what happened. I, I was mentioning Teddy Roosevelt, very popular guy. Um, you know, he went. He lost his wife, went out west, turned himself into a cowboy. You probably know the story. Um, I can tell you a lot of things about heroic things he done. Won the Nobel Peace Prize. He was, in his age, the most popular president in that whole period of time. Even after he left the White House, when he toured Europe, people still thought he was president of the United States. But, um, but something, a weird split in the Republican Party. We won't go through the details. It, the point is, in 1912, under normal circumstances, he would have been elected president, which meant he would have been president during the start of World War I. And I, and I think every historian would agree he would have had a tremendous impact on the start of that war. We maybe can argue how the impact would have gone down. Probably it wouldn't have been nearly as bad. It would have probably ended quickly. Um, America had a lot of power back then, and he knew how to use it. Um, and Satan knew what was up ahead. You know, he's building up the powder keg of Europe for, for World War I. And World War I really changed the world. It brought in things like first genocide, concentration camps, poison gassing, the, the bombing of cities from the air. I think actually they bombed London. They used dirigibles, but same principle with poison gas and um, a whole lot of other bad things, we'll go into them now. And World War II was like stage two of World War I because the guy that got to be president, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, actually was self-righteous, a stone racist, loved the Ku Klux Klan. And in the Versailles Treaty, they built in what made World War II almost a sure thing. Um, now, we go to the present. Donald Trump, you know, popular guy, very rich guy. He could have just stayed, you know, rich playboy, lived, lived the life. He decided, actually lost half his wealth in it, um, becoming president because he saw some bad trends in America. And during his four years, the world had peace. The Russians had moved twice to take Crimea and Georgia. Uh, that's Georgia and, and Europe parts of the former Russian Empire, and he took those during the Obama years, but during the Trump years, nothing, didn't dare make a move. Hamas didn't do any major significant terrorism during its four years. North Korea, he worked with them, but they behaved themselves. He was putting crushing sanctions on Iran. They couldn't afford to do anything. Um, and the world had, nothing's ever perfect, but relative peace. Well, I think the devil has plans. I'm giving an opinion, of course. And they had to get Trump out of the way. Well, they did. They got Trump out of the way. And now, of course, and we were saying that during the Prophecy Forum, the very night we were saying it, Hamas was opening up a, a horrible slaughter. We didn't know it. I guess we hadn't seen the news yet because I was, get, and I was working on my Bible stuff instead of watching world news. The very night we were saying Hamas was opening up their slaughter attack, which I think they now say maybe 1,500 Israelis were slaughtered, including in one kibbutz. Was it 40 babies were beheaded? I, I just heard that this morning. Well, I won't go into the details, but horrible stuff went on. That very night we said it, horrible things are starting to happen. Now, what may happen, obviously predicting the how this will go out, we don't know. But um, apparently Netanyahu, is, you know, obviously he's tougher than the other guy 
more liberal guy would have been, Netanyahu is all for um, ending Hamas's existence on the on their border, uh, and already, m even before he even got started, the UN and others said, "No, no, you can't declare war on Hamas. What about the innocent civilians?" By the way, you know Hamas has great propaganda industry. They intentionally put civilians out in front, intentionally, so they will get killed, knowing that the media, Western media, will pick that up and say, oh, you can't strike back at these guys because they got, they're, they're hiding behind women and children and w whatever. Well, there's not a whole lot I can say except um, sometimes evil has to be excised. If you really looked at Bible history, some of those same peoples were in Canaan and God just said, get rid of them, either kill them all or run them out of the country. Maybe did a little bit of both, but um, now God will take care of them in the next resurrection, so I'm not uh, worried about them in that perspective. But the point is, sometimes you, you have to really get tough with evil. Assuming Israel will follow through, you know what's going to happen. The, the world media will turn on Israel, and it's going to get ugly, real ugly. How this will, how the next couple steps, it's hard to tell, but it may go into a, a higher level war. Other countries may, uh, by the way, do you know that Israel and Saudi Arabia, the heart of Islam, where Mecca is, were about to make some kind of peace deal just weeks away. The, by the way, Abraham Accords are still holding up. Well, at least they were. And they, a lot of people think that's why Iran you know, pumped all that money into Hezbollah buying missiles and guns and weapons and gave them the okay to do it because they, they reason that when Israel strikes back, we can, all Islamic countries will be forced to support them and hate Israel, and, and, and that, uh, Iran wants that, of course, to get rid of that peace accord. And it probably will go that way. By the way, an interesting aside, uh, all the American airlines have canceled flights in and out of Israel. Germany has doubled their flights into Israel, Lufthansa, to get people out. And, and I thought to myself, and Natalie actually helped me think of this, why is Germany helping Israel? She said, well, maybe they're making up for the Holocaust, but can you see a strategy? Germany will become the friend of Israel when other countries like America are going to be stepping back. Joe Biden's already showing some cold feet about the count already. I won't go into detail stuff I saw last night on somewhere on the media. But can you see how that could fit Bible prophecy? If Germany is the spearhead of a united Europe, Holy Roman Empire of the future, they're going to have to get into the Middle East so they can suddenly turn on Israel. Like, you know, when Jerusalem is around, you got 24, you got a few hours to get out or it's too late. Well, maybe they'll replace America as their trusted ally. You see, because normally they would never trust Germany, but they're working on them. This is just one thing. I realize I'm speculating about a lot of this, and we, we, you know, we don't know for sure. But what I think the Bible wants people to do, and there are a few people, uh, even among our brethren who don't think we should be watching world events and politics and whatever, I contend that if we're going to go into the scriptures in a minute, we should watch world events. We should watch the morality of our nation, the morality of the Western world, what churches are doing. Um, and, you know, silence is almost like complicity. Complicity. <laughs> Complicity. That's what I meant. And a lot of churches are afraid because of they don't want to lose their tax status or they don't want some of their members to stop putting money in the plate. They're afraid to say anything about abortion, about destruction of the family, about basic morality, about shacking up. And I could elaborate, but you get the general idea. Well, that is actually hurting the morality of America, damaging the country. It actually hurts the economy because you get less new families, and new families are the ones that, that buy appliances, and I don't go into details, but you get the idea. It hurts the economy, too. Um, 
it hurts the birth rate. Watch economic issues, because economic issues are important. People think, well, run up a vast national debt, what do I care? Well, you will care as inflation starts to eat away the value of your dollar. And someday, uh, we could have banking problems and, and um, currency problems. But we'll see. I'm not, I don't think it's going to happen right away, so don't panic or anything. But it does matter. And watch world events. And all the three are related. They're all related. World morality, economic events, and world affairs. Now, in the very set of scriptures in 1 Thessalonians where Paul in chapter 4 talked about watching world events and not being worried about those that have passed away because Christ is coming back and we'll see them all together. In that very section, the very next few verses, 1 Thessalonians 5, he, he adds more to it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, he says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So we, don't, we can't nail down the exact date. Um, now, after the, the temple is um, desecrated, then we're on a countdown with maybe three possible dates, but you know, it's going to be hard to even know when that's going to happen. For when they say, peace, peace, then sudden destruction. And by the way, you know that happened in World War II, and probably some version of that's going to happen in the future. You're going to think the world's got it all worked out, the beast and the false prophet. They won't take that title. They'll be the great emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the mighty, whatever his title is, prime minister, of whatever his title will be, and the super pope, or whatever his title will be, have got the world under control. We've unified religions. Everything's going to be perfect. Then sudden destruction. Uh, it's going to, and with, with modern weapons, it can happen faster than ever. I mean, I think some of these missiles in like half an hour, they can travel maybe a third of the globe and hit their targets with nuclear weapons. And uh, someone said even just an EMP in the atmosphere, maybe one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, knocking out all our computers would cripple this country like you, uh, that's all it would take. That's what one guy speculated. Uh, we will see. But anyway, sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But I don't think it's going to catch us so off guard. And here's why. Verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that day should overtake you as a thief. When he says not in darkness, he means the rest of the world is going to go, oh, it's all well and good. And, and Hollywood tells me it's all wonderful and whatever they're telling you in the media, you know, when everything's fine, when it really isn't. But we, um, we're watching world events and all those issues like morality, economics. Uh, one thing that may even seem minor, I think that the way the liberals have handled the COVID response undermine the work ethic. And you hear this from all kinds of businesses. They can't keep good workers long. They stay a few months, and I guess they can play games on unemployment. They know how to play the game, and the government's got all kinds of programs. And so they say, hey, I'm, I'm just about as well off staying home playing video games. Why should I bother to work at your crappy job working for my crappy boss? You know? um, and you might, well, that's just a minor thing. Is undermining the work ethic, especially among the younger generation, a minor thing? It's going to hurt our economy long term. You wait and see. Um, <clears throat> you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Notice the world's in darkness, but not us. Verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as, as others do. In other words, while the others are asleep... We're watching. We're awake and watching events. But let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. In other words, the devil's message to the world is go out there and have another piece of candy. Grab a couple uh, shots of uh, Johnny Walker or something. You know, uh, get drunk, get fat, eat 
all the candy and cake you want. Not that I'm against candy or cake, but I'm making a point here. And uh, don't care what you do, watch, say. It's just all fun and games, all decadence. Um, we need to remain awake, analyzing trends, um, and kind of armed with prophetic information and patterns. Even if we don't have them all correct, the fact that we know them, when they, when they fit into place, we'll say, aha, so that's what the Bible meant. Isaiah 56.10. This is an interesting set of scripture. Now, Isaiah is witnessing to the decline of Israel and especially Judah. And as he's witnessing to Judah about their decline, all the principles would apply to what happened to the Northern Ten, but he says of their leaders, especially the clerics, but it would apply to the political leaders too, Here's what he says. <clears throat> His watchmen are blind. In other words, they can't really see what's going on because they don't know what to look for or they're not looking. They're all ignorant. And I don't think he means they're stupid. I think he means they don't know basic principles that they should know and don't know biblical principles or godly principles. Isaiah 56.10. They're dumb dogs. They cannot bark. In other words... If you have a watchdog at your junkyard, the famous junkyard dog, um, you put him in the junkyard at night because people used to, I assume they used to still do, climb in the junkyards and get car parts and car stuff that they can use and metal and stuff. Well, they put these, uh, they let the dogs roam the yard at night and they bark and scare the thieves away. Man, that dog looks mean and he's barking. Well, isn't that what a watchdog is supposed to do? Technically, the media is supposed to be our watchdogs. I know they're lapdogs or propagandists for the left, but the media is supposed to be watchdogs. I mean, that's how the Founding Fathers thought it would be designed, that they would be the watchdogs. And, and the, up until maybe the last 50, 60, 70 years, we had media on both sides. So at least one side, if not both, would be barking if politicians did something too awful, at least a fair amount of the time. Well, there, she says, they cannot bark. Sleeping. Because they're not watching, they're sleeping. Lying down. Loving to slumber. Yes, they are greedy dogs, which never have enough. In other words, our religious leaders, political leaders, and media leaders are greedy. All they want. And um, by the way, I saw this cartoon, The Buffalo Gap. It showed, you know, how the NASCAR drivers have in their jacket, their sponsors. He said, our politicians should be like NASCAR. Where the names of the people that own them? You know, is it Big Pharma, Big Labor, Teachers Union, whatever, you know what I'm saying. Um, there are legal bribes they give to their campaign, and they can use the campaign money to live on. It's all a matter of how you do it. And then they give their spouses and kids all kind of Big time jobs. There are legal bribes. Yes, there are legal bribes. And people in the media go from media job to a high priced government job and then back to the media. They're, they're bribing. It's a form of legal bribery. They're all getting fat, but they're not doing the job of barking, warning us. And they are shepherds who cannot understand. And in some cases, I really don't think they understand geopolitics economics. They might have come out of a school like Harvard and they study gender studies. Oh, wow. They know why men are bad. That's what they're experts on. Why men are bad and the radical view is wonderful. Or everything is colonialism. And I could go off on that about how rotten academia has gotten. Uh, so a lot of times you think these reporters understand some of the issues. They don't. Some of them do. I suppose the older ones do, but they're corrupted too. But a lot of them, they really don't even understand. They don't know what they're talking about. You see them say, wait a minute, why didn't you ask them the follow-up question about this or that? They just accept stupid stuff because they don't know and they don't want to know. Everyone for his own gain, for his own territory. They're all selfish. And um, like if you listen to some movie star or singing star, or sports star tell you about life or about how you should feel about communist China, 
They don't know anything. Or they're looking at the bottom line. If I say anything about communist China, my tennis shoe contract, which is worth millions every year, the commies don't play, they'll cut me off. I'm not saying a thing, or I'll say something good about them. And that's who you're listening to for your advice. Who are shepherds of our world? The clerics, the media pundits, academic leaders, teachers, celebrities. Our watchdogs do not bark an alarm. Um, for instance, you know, it's almost 50% of American children now, according to some stats I saw last year, almost live in a home without a committed dad. There are all kinds of stats, even Obama admitted, that show that's bad for kids. They have a much higher rate of, of crime. The girls have a much higher rate of early out of wedlock teen pregnancy. I know we don't think, I know in the modern world, in all the shows, fathers are stupid and bad, but fathers are important. I mean, mothers are important too. I'm not trying to, but you need both parents. Like, you need both arms. And fatherhood is important. And um, all I can say is, I think there's been an attack on fatherhood. I think it's been going on for a long time, but it, it's now going to have its effect. You have a lot of angry young men. They may not even know why they're angry, but I think a lack of fatherhood in a kind of stable family, at least as part of it, um, it's scary. Um, and um, verse 12, come, one says, I'll bring wine and we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will be as today and much more abundant. In other words, there's no danger out in the future. Drink, eat candy, have fun. And the devil would be whispering, yes, that's what you should do. Take another cocktail. Eat some more wonderful candy. <laughs> and relax. There's nothing in the future to worry about. Philippians 3.1. Philippians 3.1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For to me, to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Now, here's the problem we have. Um, and I haven't solved the problem, but I want to talk about it. The problem is, you don't want to let watching the world and politics depress you. And I will admit, it appears often that the bad guys win. Like Teddy Roosevelt, at least he would have made a significant difference. And you, know, you might say it's part his problem. We can argue about how the Republican Party got split for the 1912 election. But I know the devil was behind it, in my opinion. The devil knew who to remove so he could do what he wanted to do. And the same thing with Trump. I'm not saying the guys, Teddy or Trump, are perfect. You know, nobody is perfect. But you want to get the peacemakers out of the way so you can do what you want to do. Um, and sooner or later, if not soon, at some point in the near future, evil will win, at least for a few short years. Well, how do we not get depressed? A certain amount of sighing and crying is normal and natural, so I'm not saying it's not going to happen. But the trick is for us to be primarily rejoiceful and happy, even as we see prophecies pulling us toward an end of the world that will be bad, and then in a few years Christ will be kick them out of power and then we'll have paradise. But for a few years things are going to go down. Um, so one is remind ourselves that our hero, the Messiah, is coming. But war, the evil war-making, famine-driving events are going to happen. It is possible, Ukraine war and some other things, that we could have what well, they call it food insecurity, even worse this winter than last winter. Um, and energy insecurity, energy prices higher. We'll see. So you can say, oh, how can I rejoice when bad things are happening in the world? Well, one is, most of it isn't happening to us yet. We should be thankful. I was just looking around as we drove through the, um, the Ozark Mountains. You know, when you go through a place like that, things are still fairly peaceful, fairly beautiful. 
Cape Girardeau, I, I hope I don't jinx my, by saying this, is still a relatively peaceful town. And the people on my corner of the block all seem to be trying to protect me and help me. I'm just saying that's how it looks. We got good neighbors. So we are still, as you look at the world as a whole, we're relatively blessed. You probably don't think about it, but there are people in the world that they got to spend over 50 percent of their money for food and are worried about this or that. That's why they're rushing across our border. They want a better life, but also the freedom we have. We are still blessed. Now, how long it lasts? <laughs> I'm not going to make any predictions, but um, <clears throat> but I will say this much: if you can save a little extra food, save a few extra dollars. It might be smart for short-time crises, but you don't have to. Um, but remember, our hero is coming soon. The more Prophecy seems to be fulfilled. And by the way, I'm kicking this out as a possibility. If things go bad for Israel, really bad, that might encourage them to build the third temple, which will move us closer to Christ's return. Everything will, well, almost everything will be in place. Well, here's some things that can help us rejoice, because God wants us to basically keep a positive spirit. Uh, by the way, even in the day when Paul was writing these letters, there was a certain amount of persecution of Christians even then from pagans and from the more religious Jews. So he still told them to rejoice. Music helps. Find some good distractions, maybe good hobbies, good distractions. Focus on the good things we still have. We still have a lot of good things, right? And we may have them for a few more years. I mean, I'm assuming we will. I, I don't want to jinx this, but um, enjoy life. Now I want to talk about the parable of the lion and the mouse. Remember this parable. This big male lion is lying the outside his lair, and a mouse sleeping runs across his nose. He wakes up, boom, pounces his big paw on the mouse. How dare you wake me up, you little scrawny little mouse? And the mouse begs for pardon for him not eating. He says, you're so tiny. <laughs> All I would do is wake up my appetite. You're not worth eating. And he said, well, if you let me go, says the mouse, I will do a big favor for you. You're going to need me someday. The lion laughs. <laughs> There's no way a teeny little thing like you could ever help a big, powerful lion. Well, one day the lion's out roaming. He hits a tripwire. And this big rope net boom, springs up and pulls him in the tree. And he's hanging in the tree. He knows, of course, some hunters have said it. And eventually they're going to come by the trap and, I assume, shoot him and have a big lion's head on their mantle. So he lets out a roar for help. And he roars, and, and all through the jungle, the roar echoes. And the mouse hears it. And the mouse runs over, climbs up the tree. He sees the situation. The mouse runs down the, the rope, and, and he chews at certain key little points on it. Kind of, after an hour or two, he's chewed enough to make a circle where the lion can push it out and get out of the trap. And as the lion is walking away, the mouse says, see, I told you, someday someone little like me could be helpful. Now, why am I telling you that parable from the lion and the mouse? I, I know we're tiny. We're really tiny. People say, yeah, you're a tiny organization. You are hardly even being noticed by the world. We still could play someday a significant role in witnessing and warning. And I know you're thinking, oh, no way. And maybe I'm wrong in thinking that, but it could. Or at least we should be positive and say, God, let me do what I can, and maybe it'll, it'll make a difference. So help God's work make a difference. I think God will like that. It's like that expression... Um, it's a positive thing when you see the feet of one who brings the gospel message. You know, in the old days, especially when there weren't a lot of horses involved in the battle, most foot battles, infantry battles, the king in the back, if they were winning, he'd see somebody running from the front lines and say, how wonderful are his feet. With good news, we have won, we're safe, or whatever he'd say. But we want to be helping push the gospel of Christ, the good news that Christ is coming to solve the world problems. 
Back to 1 Thessalonians 5. Back to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16. Rejoice always. And that's hard to stay positive, isn't it? And I'm, I'm admitting it, it's hard to stay positive, but that's the trick. If you can watch events, at least some of which will be negative, still stay positive overall. Pray without ceasing. You know, one of the things we can do is I would say pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the armies of Israel fighting against the, the people that slaughtered and butchered those young people at that concert. And it was on the last great day of the feast. By the way, that wasn't a coincidence that Hamas chose a holy day to attack because they knew a majority of the people would be celebrating because um, that concert was part of the last day celebration. The Jews, I've seen them dance around in a big circle and wave flags and have music and dancing and food. And, um, and I think they even know that their holiday schedule is not going to be as militarily as tight as a regular. The last time a big attack was, was during the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur War. Believe me, the devil did that intentionally. It was not an accident. Um, but pray for Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I believe the more America supports Israel, the more America will be blessed. If America gets cold feet like some people predict in a few weeks and back off, I don't think God is going to be happy with America. But um, <clears throat> in everything, give thanks. So we should be thankful for what we do have. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Follow God's spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Try to get out of all the sermons you hear, things, booklets, and things you see online. Get out of it what you can, as much as you can. Test all things. Hold fast with what is good. So, you know, if you hear some bad stuff, avoid it. Abstain from every form of evil. Every form. You know, all kinds of forms. And just when you see it, get away from it. Stay alert. Rejoice. The Messiah is coming. Do not relax. Do not let down our guards, because we've got to guard against our human nature, and yet rejoice. Ephesians 5.19. Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So music will help. Good music. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. One reason... God loved David so much was he sung to God. I always thought that probably when he was maybe 15 or 16, he was guarding the sheep one night, and he had his little lyre, and apparently he was a very good musician. He was looking up at the stars, and he, I guess, created or designed a song praising God. And he said, what is man that you even care about us looking at the magnificence of the stars? And God saw that heart for David, the music spirit that loved God and wanted to be with God and recognize God's greatness. God saw that and God said, even though he's probably only 60, that's the man I want. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you another story, but it kind of makes a point, sort of. Uh, and if you don't like this joke, blame the person that sent it to me on the internet. <laughs> Three men are in a cafe. One's an engineer, One's an architect and one's an artist. And the artist says, I want you all to consider a question. Artists think this way. He says to all of them, what would you rather have? What's better, a torrid, exciting affair with a new woman or a secure relationship with a nice wife? What would you rather have? And the artist says, to tell you the truth, I prefer an affair with a dangerous, exciting, elusive new woman. That's what the artist wanted. The architect chimed in, well, I prefer the stability of knowing a nice wife is always there to support me all the time. Well, the engineer looked up from his notes, and uh, he says, I want both. It shocked him. I said, what do you mean you want both? He says, well, that way each lady will think I'm with the other one, and I'll be back at the office getting some work done. <laughs> So the fact the engineer really didn't want either. He wanted to work. 
<laughs> well, some of you didn't get it. You're not all smiling. You didn't get that one. <laughs> the engineer said both. I want. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> each one would think he's with the other one when he's not with either one. But anyway, what the engineer was saying is he wants to focus on his job of engineering and building and whatever he's into. Well, we can learn also to focus our minds, even while we're watching world events, try to focus our hearts on being positive, doing what God wants us to do. Ephesians 5 again, we're, we're finishing up Ephesians 5 as we get near the end of this message. Ephesians 5.20 giving thanks always for all things to God. The more thankful we are, the more we can rejoice and be positive. Uh, always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You know, cooperating with other church members. I've heard people say, well, God has revealed something to me and I don't care what anybody else says. I'm doing my own thing and I'm not cooperating with anybody else. Uh, that's not the attitude. Um, God says cooperate with other Christians. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Philippians 4.8. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely. Think about the lovely things, like beautiful forest in the fall. Whatever things are of good report, because there's still some good news out there. I heard, I heard one piece of good news. Court decisions have been coming out lately for to support school choice, even coming out of the Supreme Court, surprising people, which is good for families um, where you have bad public schools. And in a lot of places, bad public schools. As a matter of fact, they were saying on news, I don't know the locality, but as they recorded it, reported out of Paducah, 50% of the kids graduating from high school cannot get the minimal ACT score that, you know, that they asked for. And we're not talking about New York City or Chicago. I think they mean more or less much of America. Um, so public school, and that's good news that people can get out of some of these bad schools. Um, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, think or meditate on these things. Philippians 4.11. 4.11, not that I speak in regard to need. Now, Paul was thanking them for giving him money for his ministry when other churches didn't, like the Corinthian church. For I learned in whatever state I am to be content. Paul actually says he's learned whether he's up or down. A lot of money or not enough money, Paul is content. He has the maturity to be content. And that's what we want to shoot for, the maturity. Okay, it's good when you have enough money. And it's nice when you go to the feast and you can pay for meals and do, you know, stuff. And, and uh, actually, we had three paid-for meals. But, it, but it's nice to have good stuff. But can you be content when you only have beans to eat, right? But Paul could be content. And the day may come when we may get tested. Food prices may get so high. You say, steak, are you kidding me? Chicken breast? I know a person who was shocked. He went to the store to get chicken breast on the East Coast. Um, it costs like double what it used to. He said, what? I can't believe it. Anyway, I'll tell you about that later. But <clears throat> we should be mature enough to be content no matter what. Verse 12, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and both to suffer. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So what we need to do is, we know, I, I predict that in the next two to six years, the devil is clearing the way for some big events. And the very day we said that, one of the big events started. We now could have a much bigger general war messing up what peace deals that were being made in the Middle East. They were going for more peace cooperation. That may all be flushed down the toilet. The Middle East could become a bigger conflag conflagration. Um, we'll see. 
Um, so that's two fronts, in Europe, the Middle East, and then I think China's at least going to keep the pressure on Taiwan to give in. They've got, I call it a semi-blockade of Taiwan, and uh, they say if they go, they'll probably ask the North Koreans to invade South Korea simultaneously, tying up the American military. All that could happen. I'm not, you know, I've heard that. I'm not saying it will, but it could. We could have three war fronts in the near future. But whatever it is, I believe big things are coming down the pike. The devil has cleared the pathway for it. Um, now, maybe that can be reversed and our prayers can change God's mind. He could stop in and block it. Um, and this, as I said, we didn't know about the Gaza war when we said that. So what we said was turned out to be more true than we thought. And uh, the Arab-Israeli deal could fall apart. And by the way, since we limit our oil industry, by the way, do you know uh, the current administration actually closed oil wells permanently? That is, they did something to destroy and put semen in the pipeline. So they, we can't just turn back on the oil wells that they closed down. They permanently closed them down. Since we've limited our oil production, if bad things happen in the Middle East and other issues, and energy costs spike, that will have a bad impact on the world. It's possible. And, uh, but we can appreciate Satan's moves. We know what he's after. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. Uh, and, and let the world events motivate us to get closer to God. As we see bad things, get closer to God. Because men will say they can create lasting utopia. Every time they've tried, it actually horrible things end up happening. Communism, fascism, socialism. Um, only Christ can create a true paradise, and he's coming. Rejoice even while we see the world headed for trouble.